Today we're going to take a look at nitrogenase, which is an enzyme found in bacteria. And this enzyme takes atmospheric nitrogen and converts it into ammonia that can be taken up by plants. If you want to know about the structure of an enzyme, a great place to look is the protein data bank. Uh, and I'm just going to follow this direct link in. And here we have on the left um, that the structure of nitrogenase. And I'm going to select structure here. I'm going to get a closer look at it. And I can grab this structure and rotate around. We can zoom in or out. Um, and we can see all of these alpha helices in the structure. We can see these beta sheets, these loops, so all these classic pieces of a protein structure. But actually what I'm more interested in today, because we're really doing some inorganic chemistry today, is to take a look at the ligands. The ligands are just the pieces that are bound by the protein. And so what I'm specifically interested in is this piece here, as I rotate around it, this is an iron sulfur cluster. Uh, these red atoms are irons, the yellow ones are sulfurs. Most of them are sulfide atoms, uh, sulfide ions, so a sulfur two minus ion. Um, one of the sulfurs on the left is a part of a cysteine, this piece of protein. Um, and over on the right, we have a molybdenum atom here. Um, so it's uh, sometimes called an iron molybdenum cluster. Um, and this is the piece we're going to focus on for the next couple of minutes. So if we take a look at that active site just by itself, we're ignoring the protein for now. We can see all of these pieces that make it up. We've got some iron atoms. We've got that molybdenum atom. Um, these individual sulfurs not attached to anything else. If we took them by themselves and gave them their octets, those would all be sulfur two minus ions, right? Whereas if we took this cysteine by itself, gave it its electrons back, it would just be a one minus ion and so on. So we can figure out what all of these donors are contributing to this, this um, cluster. Once we do that and take into account the charges of other things, what we find is that we've got a mixture here of iron plus two and iron plus three. Um, so it's a mixed oxidation state species. You wouldn't necessarily try to figure out which iron is plus one, which iron is plus two, and which iron is plus three. That would be pretty laborious, um, but it's a mixture of different oxidation states. Um, there's also a curious ligand in the middle here. Um, it's thought to be a carbide anion. It's not entirely clear. It could be a nitride an anion. This could be a nitrogen instead. Uh, it turns out it's difficult to see this little atom in here. Um, because the surrounding atoms are much larger than it is. You know, in X-ray crystallography, you know, the number of electrons on an atom, uh, the more electrons it has, the brighter it shows up in X-ray crystallography. So this is probably a carbide, uh, so C4 minus. But it's not completely clear. But why do we have all of these atoms? in this cluster to reduce nitrogen to ammonia? And the general answer is that we've got to reduce that nitrogen, the dinitrogen, by six electrons to get to ammonia. Um, and that's a lot of electrons. And so we need a reservoir of lots of electrons so that we can efficiently convert nitrogen all the way down to ammonia. And the protons in ammonia would come from surrounding amino acids. So how does this happen? Let's take a look at some possible mechanisms. Um, and you've seen organometallic chemistry before, so you, you, you've seen things like insertion reactions. Um, so 
that type of mechanism has been proposed as a possibility in these cases. So the, the iron cluster would have to bind an ammonia molecule. Uh, there would be electrons brought in uh, through neighboring um, proteins and so on, providing electrons. And those electrons would probably reduce the iron itself. So this electron is going to the iron to convert it to an iron two. And protonations could happen at the iron. This is not something that we see a whole lot of, uh, but it's possible to do this in the lab and it may be happening here in this enzyme. But that's an oxidative addition. So that means we've got iron two going to iron four. It's not out of the realm of the possible, but it's not very common to see iron four. And a one, two insertion of that hydride then would lead to um, the first step, we've broken the, pi, the first pi bond in nit nitrogen, we've added the first hydrogen on, onto one of the nitrogens, and we just continue back through these sorts of steps again, adding more electrons, adding more protons until we finally got to ammonia. So that's a possible mechanism. The other possible mechanism is that we, again, we add electrons to the iron to reduce it, but then the iron might immediately go ahead and transfer an electron into this system. And so I'll say, we're doing this. We're transferring one electron into the pi bond of the dinitrogen. And then if we're thinking about protonating anywhere, um, the obvious place to protonate would be and a lone pair on nitrogen. And again, we would keep cycling back in, adding more electrons, adding more protons, uh, until we had fully reduced the dinitrogen to ammonia. So there are a couple of possible mechanisms. The second one is probably um, more widely thought about than the first one, but there have been some proposals about the other one. So this is an example where the science is ongoing. We don't know exactly how nitrogenase works. And part of the reason we don't know exactly how nitrogenase works is that the system is so complicated. We've got this rather large metal cluster inside this extremely large protein. And it's difficult to follow with any certainty um, what exactly is going on inside.